And, and amid all of, all of that, I think, you know, I think Emerson, as, if I remember it rightly, I think I'm, I'm right in saying that Emerson left and soon after we brought in a, a, a Gaza, um, <laughs> as a, <laughs> you know, just to get a, a quiet time in the, in the dressing room, bring a bit of calm to the dressing room. I mean, what, come on, what, what was, what, Higgy, I know you've got dozens of stories. Tell us just one of your Gaza stories. I've got, I'm, Dave, I've got so many that they're all unbelievable stories. I mean, the first day I met him when we, it was a cup final and I'd, I'd been left out because I wouldn't sign a new deal and, and Gazza had come to me and he'd said he wanted to tell Robbo he didn't want to play, that I should have played. And, and he end, I ended up rooming with him then. He said, come and room with me. So I went and room with him. And the three days I had at Burnham Beaches before that cup final with him, he was subbed in the game. I wasn't involved. And... We had three unbelievable days that I could write a book about, you know, from playing snooker to then bowling white balls at Hughes to try and snap them before we went out to not, <laughs> not being in the room without a light on and the television blaring to throwing a cat out the hotel window through, you know, not didn't hurt it, he just threw it into a tree. And, and <laughs> but apparently he always used to do it. But, but that was just like the first three days I met him. We went into Burnham Beaches and he's, he's in a pub. We get a lift back off a woman who he doesn't know. And just mad things happen. You know, he, he kicks a ball away from these young lads who wanted to play football with Gaza. He gets this ball and he boots it over the back gardens and then just gives them 50 quid to go and buy a new ball. And you just think, you know, if he lives his life like this, this is three days, then his life must just be nuts. I mean, some of the things that him and Jimmy used to do and, we used to see them do. It, Jimmy Five just, Bellies. Yeah, they're just legendary. Jimmy was Jimmy was brilliant for Gaza, and it, it just to be around him. I mean, the first day he was there, I think he went into the canteen naked. He'd have a shower, and then he, he went in naked for some food. And you just think, <laughs> this this fella's like, all he did. So the two things that Gaza did was he lived for football and for making people laugh. And if he was doing them two things, didn't matter what else was going on in his life, he was happy. He, he was. He was so good to have around. If he thought he'd ever embarrass someone or upset someone, he'd be devastated because that wasn't him. He just wanted to make people laugh. But because he'd get away with everything, there was no line. There was no line for him, you know, whether that was a police line or whether it, it didn't matter because he'd let him off with it because he was Gaza. You know, it was just, it, it was an eye-opener for me to see what his life was like. I mean, I, I don't think I could have stood it. I don't think I could have, could have lived a life like him with the scrutiny he was under and with the way people used to follow him and cameras used to be on him and every little move was analysed and it must have been a, a really tough life for him, especially with some of the things he had going on in it. But yeah, as a lad right. and as a player, fantastic. Steve, what about yourself? Do you remember much of, much of that Gaza era? Yeah, like he said before there, it's um, every day, every day where you had a laugh, you would always laugh no matter what. And I remember... I remember Gaza coming in. He used to come in, like Iggy said before there, he was he came in with a dressing gown on and a pair of flip-flops and nothing else. That was it. He had nothing underneath it. And, and Jimmy used to drive him in. And he used to have that doctor's baggage. Do you remember the doctor's bag he used to have? Yeah, with all his tablets. Yeah, like a, like a doctor's bag and it was just full of, of Red Bull. <laughs> Whatever. And there was it's nothing else in it. That was it. That was it. And that was it. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, how... How would you get away with it? But he was Gaza and he did get away with it. And every day was different. You know, we used to go into training thinking, what's going to happen next? How is he going to be? Um, and one story I've got is um, the trip we had to, to Libya. Were you on that trip, Igor? Had you gone no, by then? No, I'd gone by Libya. then, thankfully. <laughs> Libya was, was under, I mean, we'll come to that probably later. But um, I remember, obviously, Gaza, with Gaza being at Lazio, um, he played with one of uh, one of Gaddafi's sons who was there at Lazio at the time, and uh, we went on this this what became part of a trade mission to uh, to Libya along with Bari from Italy, and we played the Libyan national team. And on our, our way back out of the country at the end of the trip, we got we had a date to to Gaddafi's Gaddafi's palace out in the desert. Nobody wanted to go, um, but we basically we were forced to go, and. Um, we were we had this tour of Gaddafi's palace and it showed you where the Americans had bombed this palace uh, at the time. 
and it had just been left as it was in a big hole in the ceiling where this missile had come through and it apparently it had killed his, uh, his stepdaughter or something like that. And as we were going out, we were there maybe half an hour. Um, there was a guest book and I thought it's strange there being a guest book in this place because there was murals on the wall and everything, everything just being left as a shrine. And there was a guest book and nobody wanted to sign it except Gaza. And Gaza went across to the book, he sat down and he signed, he went, Everybody said, what are you going to do? He said, I'll sign it. So he went, to the colonel, best wishes, Gaza. <laughs> signed it to Gaddafi, to the colonel, best wishes, Gaza. And I'll always remember that, because I was sat there, but I was watching them thinking, what on earth? And it was, well, that's what he was like. He, was, he would do anything, anywhere. And there was never, ever a dull moment when he was in your presence. It doesn't matter where it was. There was always something to laugh at. And, the times he was at the, you know, the time he was at the club might not have been the best footballing time for Gaza, but um, as a, as a as a player yourself, you knew when you went in to train, you were going to enjoy the day, just, or just have a laugh somewhere down the line. It was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. what? So I know we could talk about uh, Gaza all day, and uh, I've heard Iggy talk about Gaza all night uh, um, uh, before, but. There's so many other characters, wasn't there, in that era? And I mean, who, 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 who shall we touch on? I mean, should we Merson, Janino, Branco? Branco. I mean, Branco. Oh, he, I, I think I was on record to say he played in the 58 World Cup in Sweden because <laughs> he, there was no way in the world that he was 30, whatever, when he first no, He must have been 44. 32 he, he was, Higgy, the record said. 32. Said yeah. what? 32. 32. No, yeah, no chance. Yeah, 42. Dodgy 42. But again, he was how funny was he? He was he was unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, strike the ball, talk about striking the ball. And he was the one who who brought that hit the valve type thing. You know, you'd see him every day after training and he'd be smashing the valve with the ball. And and if you hit the valve properly, the ball would like do mad things, it'd swerve all over the place. But that's something that he did, you know, the Brazilians did it. But he was again, <laughs> I don't know how much he was getting, but he was um, he was Unbelievable. off his head. You know, you see people what what they've done in the game, and then you see how they are as people. I mean, he must have smoked eighty fags a day. He was <laughs> yeah. he all he did was have a laugh. He just come over here and had a laugh. It was it was unbelievable, really. Um, and I remember the was it his first game on one of them? He, he took a free kick against Everton. Yeah. And he smashed this thing, and I think it hit the post, and you could hear everyone on the ground go wow. But I think that was the only thing he'd done. He was. Um, yeah. Did he? Did he not play uh, when he when he first came? Did he not play? I think he played a reserve game, and there was about fifteen thousand yeah. people there came to watch, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He did. There was. It was. Uh, it was like a proper game. Yeah. But he, he was. I mean, I, I I don't know who scouted him, um, but <laughs> I think they just signed him on past videos. I think Pele had sent the video <laughs> in from the '58 Sweden World Cup, and uh, but he was. He was great. He was good fun. He was he, yeah, he was, yeah. He mucked in with the other Brazilian lads really well. And and Juni, you know, to be fair to him, Juni, what a not only an unbelievable player, but what a great lad, you know. Harmless to anyone, loved everyone, had time for everyone, worked unbelievably hard. And he was one of them humble humble superstar, I'd call him. You know, when he first came, it, it didn't happen for him straight away. He had to work really hard because he knew it was a different game. And the work he put in every day after training, doing pitch runs, because he knew that the game was so much more physical over here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when he when he did get up to speed and, and he knew what it was all about, absolutely unplayable. And shouldn't have been because he was, what, five foot six and yeah. about eight stone. He was, um, some of the things he used to do on a football pitch was incredible. And, and some of the, the people he made look silly. You know, you, you were just in awe of some of the stuff they used to do. It was, it was a brilliant time to be around with with him and, and Emerson and people like that. Do you remember? I think there's a there's a picture Iggy, of uh, speaking about Janino there of him looking up. Was it Philip Albert? Um, yeah, Albert. Newcastle, yeah. <laughs> Newcastle, and he's just got he's wagging his finger at him. And he, Jimmy's yeah. like you say, he's about five foot four, and Philip Albert was about six foot three, and it's but just. He's done it that personified what you knew was. He didn't care, did he? He didn't care. Nah. He was playing again. Didn't he care. Didn't he was a brave little bugger. And, and I think he'd had the same with Julian Dix. I think Julian Dix had tried yeah. to wipe him out and he'd, he'd done the same with him. But he, he you know, obviously he couldn't touch him. Um, he was just... And it didn't matter. If he got whacked, he'd just get up. Yeah. And he'd go and get the ball again. And we got, I mean, if he played now, 
there'd be people getting sent off left, right, and centre with them. You know, you could get away with it a little bit then, where people would whack you and maybe be allowed one tackle on you. Um, but now you you're not allowed anything. So mm-hmm. it'd have been even better now. It's um, the, the one that I mentioned there that we we haven't we we'll have to mention now. Uh, Paul Paul Merson who came in as Janino's replacement, didn't he really for that? 97, 98 yeah. season when we'd been relegated and we needed a talisman, I guess, and he came in as, you know, the direct replacement for Juni. Yeah, I mean, you don't realise sometimes how good people are until you play with them. And and mm. Paul was one who, you knew he was a, a good player, but you didn't know how good. And then when you see him, and, and for someone, again, who, who didn't use his left foot, and he only used to use the outside of his right foot, you, you would think. But the vision and the creativity and, and the goals that he scored that season. Um, when games were tight, you knew he was going to produce something, whether it was a pass, whether it was a goal, lovely little bit of vision. You knew he was going to do something in the game. And and more often than not, he did. He had a, a brilliant season. The club were were lucky to get him, actually, um, because I think he was still in the England squad. And he was, I think that was the year that he, I think he went to the World Cup. It was the France was it France 98 or something like that? And yeah. Him and Gaza missed out on it. And Gaza Mers missed out and wrecked the red room, and, uh, but Merce went. Yeah. 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 And he was, I mean, he was, he was a great lad. Mers, if you ask Merce, I think before he left, the, the year he had, he was the best he'd ever been, as in the cleanest, you know, with the drink and drugs. And he'd really looked after himself properly. And, and had a really good season. I think you could see that. And then as it went on, I think, I think the gambling on the on the bus, the gambling thing for Mace was his Achilles heel. I think he, you know, he could stop the drugs and he could stop the drink, but the gambling was something that he couldn't. Um, and there wasn't really. I know it come out and he said there was a gambling culture at Middlesbrough. But I can only speak for the time I was there. There wasn't really a gambling culture. People would always play cards on the bus. The odd person would have a bet on the horses. But it wasn't, it wasn't a, a massive problem at all. You know, if anything, you, you very rarely saw it, or I very rarely saw it. I don't know about Steve. And yet he used that as his reason for leaving to go to Villa. Yeah, well, he's, he's got that many things that he could use as a reason that it's, you know, it would have been the same at Villa. People would have played cards on the bus. There'd be people betting on horses. It, it's up to you. I think Paul, as a, as a person, can only help himself. And, and to be fair, he has done. You know, I... I like watching him on telly. I think he's he's got he's opinionated. He, he says his point of view, and I I got on really well with him as a as a lad and as a person. And and even after he's left, you know, he's he's been really good with me. And I've I've always got on brilliant with Paul because whilst he did have problems, he was he was a really good lad. And and what he done for Middlesbrough for that season, you know, he, to fill someone's shoes like Janino the way he did, it was a tough ask. And and he did it. I mean, the, the game away at Liverpool where he scored the goal, he's, you know, the, the games against Liverpool where we beat them in the cup, you, you can't imagine a club like us in the Championship beating Liverpool over two legs. And we, we didn't just do it once, you know what I mean? We've done it two seasons in a row. So it, it just shows you that the team we had in the Championship and how, how good it was. The, um, I've got to ask, because we haven't touched on it yet, there was that run of three cup finals in 12 months. It's amazing to think that Middlesbrough reached three successive cup finals. Sadly, we lost them all. Um, but And and I was looking, I, I, rem- I only reminded myself in a record book uh, last night that, you know, I think the, uh, you both had very different experiences of the cup finals. In fact, you, w- w- uh, I think it, the first time, Steve, you missed out and Higgy played. And then the next year, Iggy missed out and you, you played. Is it, um, I think that's a fair... I mean, what, what do you remember, Steve, of the, the, your cup final? You, you've got three cup finals to play. Mm. Um, to remind us how it went for you. Yeah, you're right. I think Leicester City uh, in the Coca-Cola Cup final, I was, I was on the bench. Um, Chelsea, FA Cup final, again, I started on the bench but came on after about 15, 20 minutes because Rav, <coughs> Rav played... Um, and he shouldn't have really. He, he was struggling with a hamstring injury, which he'd picked up uh, a week or two before, and he still wasn't right. But he decided he wanted to play, um, so we took a chance and he started. Um, after 15, 20 minutes, I think he, he came off. Um, 
And I think, I think Robbie came off as well. Rob, Robbie, Robbie was injured really after well. 20 minutes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Robbie came off as well. So I went on after 20 minutes um, and played. Um, and the following year against Chelsea in the League Cup final, the Coca-Cola again, I, and I started that year. So lots of mixed emotions. Yeah, disappointed to miss out. Like obviously Iggy will say the same thing. Um, especially the FA Cup. I think I'd played every game up to near enough up to the up to the final. Um, and I think Big Nudge, Big Nudge was injured in the lead up to the cup final. Um, he was fit for the final, and and Brian decided he just decided to leave me out, which was uh, which was a tough thing to take. But um, you know, you, there's not much you can do about it. You have to accept it. Um, but you know, thankfully, I got on the pitch after 20 minutes. It's, it's interesting because I, I saw um, there's this well-known images of um, Massimo Macaroni crying at the Carling Cup final so on the on the final whistle because mm. would have won the cup, but he's crying because he didn't get to play a part of it. it. It must feel really strange to having played a part and played games along the way, and then you get yeah. to the midday and, and you, you, you don't feel a part of it. Yeah, because it's it's you know for a player it's 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 one of the biggest days you'll have in your in your footballing career probably. It um you know I grew up watching the FA Cup final. I was like anybody else, any other any other young lad watching it on TV. Always wanted to be part of it. Um, yeah, and and when you play the majority of games leading up to the final, um, and not to be picked for the final, it was uh, yeah it was devastating really, and. I never, I didn't really get an explanation from uh, from Brian. He just uh, picked the team, no explanation as to why. And at the time, I thought, yeah, just accept it. Um, there's not much I could do about it. And uh, that, that's what I did. And just, you know, like I say, thankfully, I mean, thankfully, I did get a chance to play a part in it, even though it didn't go as we expected. I mean, after whatever it was, two minutes to be to be one nil down was was a big ask. And um, I think on the day we didn't, we maybe didn't have enough big name players who, who turned up on the day. Um, I don't think we deserve to win it on the day. So no complaints really. Iggy, what about yourself? What do you remember the the, the cup finals they played in? Well, I was I'd played in the first one against Leicester. Um, played in both of them games, and I played in the FA Cup final. Um, and I do have regrets about the FA Cup final because it. I played on the left and, and part of my or my remit was just stop Dan Protescu running forward. And that really wasn't me. You know, I wish I'd have, mm. I'd have been less disciplined and, and went and done my own thing and, and tried to do things going forward. So I think I ended up coming off after about 70 minutes of that game. Um, and I was really disappointed with it. And I remember being disappointed with it um, because I'd felt I'd wasted an opportunity of playing in a game like that. Like Steve says, you watch it as a kid and... And really, instead of instead of doing what I could do, I was sort of shepherded into mm. doing something I didn't want to do. Um, but then the third one, I, I was left out because I wouldn't sign a new deal. And that, that was the Gaza one where Gaza had come and said to me, so I, I'd played up until, I played all the games, in fact, up, up to the final. Um, I'd scored away at Reading when, when I got left by the bus. And... Um, <laughs> Tell us that story, Iggy. What, what, what happened there? Right. Uh, yeah, listen, that's when you know your teammates don't, don't have it. Oh, good yeah. it, it was, um, we played <laughs> Reading and it was quite a tight game, really tight game. And we had scored the winner with about 10 minutes left or something like that. Mace had pulled this ball down. I think Maddo had played her a ball and pulled it down and played me in and, and scored. And then after the game, obviously, you, you do the press. And we had a flight to catch. So I'm out doing the press and and then I get a phone call off Robbie Musto and and Robbie says, uh, Iggy, where are you? I said, Well I'm, I'm it was Elm Park then. I said, I'm still I'm still doing the press. And he went, Well, we're we're on the bus on the way to the airport, so um can you get home? And I'm thinking, What? So I ended up talking to Ali and, and Ali and Bernie were there and uh, I said, Listen, Ali, I need a lift home and he went, Yeah, no problem, jump in. So they were probably home at about, I don't know, 11 o'clock or something. I didn't get home till about half, two, three o'clock <laughs> in the morning by the time Ali had dropped me off at the airport. Um, and then he tells, Ali tells the story, I did tell a story where he dropped me off at the airport and I said to Ali, my car was in the, 
the car park and I couldn't get the ticket to get it out. So I said to Ali, go in the car park and drive out because you get you got three minutes then. Or drive up to the barrier. So he drove up to the barrier and it lifted. And then as he's backing away from the barrier, I've got my car out of it, obviously without paying, and I've I've sped off. And he's got pulled up by the airport security <laughs> for doing that at the barrier. <laughs> so he had to tell them what happened and the, you were all right, but him and Bernie got into a little bit of bother with it. But that's what happened. The, the lads left me and um, it was a weird one because I'm thinking, how can you, you know, I wasn't the quietest person in the world and I'm sure someone might have missed me, but no one did. You would have thought the, the, the guy that had just got them through the next round would be remembered, Higgy. No, not in that squad. <laughs> it was just like, that game's gone now, let's crack on with the next one. Yeah. But that's what it's like then, you know. I didn't. I wasn't really bothered, if I'm honest. I was, I was gutted at the time because I thought oh, I'm not going to get home till all hours here. And but I think we had a day off the next day, so it wasn't too bad. I'm going to put you both on the spot. I want to ask you for the three most influential players during your time at Borough. Easy. Come, go on, and Steve. Easy. Off you go. Right. Phil Whelan, Fabio, and Branko. <laughs> 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 Fabio had a good game that day, I remember. Three classic. Fabio was good against Huddersfield. Oh, hey. No, for me, Paul, um, Giannino is obvious, an obvious one. Giannino is an obvious one for the reasons we've spoke about. Um, Rav, for his, you know, how he influenced the season for us and the goals he scored. Uh, I would have to put Rav in there. And. Last but not least, I think the third one I would say probably Mark Schwarzer as a goalkeeper. I know I might surprise a few people, but um, Schwarzer came in and he, he he became a bit of a Middlesbrough legend, I think, in goal. He played a lot of games for the club, saved the, saved us a lot of times. Um, so yeah, I would stick him in my top three. Right, Definitely. interesting. And funny enough, the. Uh... Schwartz got a few votes when we did this, when we were asking um, Steve McLaren and his backroom staff as well. And uh, he'd been at the club years before they came in, but they're still right, yeah. Schwartz in the uh, top three. Higgy, what about yourself? I, I'd, I'd agree with with Stevie, uh, but Mark Schwartz misses out for me. And there's only one reason. Giannino and Ravinelli. Giannino, for what he did, he was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Ravinelli for... Whilst he was a, a brilliant player, he, he was the one really who made people sit up and think, you know, Middlesbrough signing all these superstars. And he he was sort of the gateway for everyone else to want to come to the Mendietas and the Bolo Zendens, Christian Zegers, Christian Caramboos, you, you name it. I mean, less than them people who played for the football club as well as Alan Boxer. It's unbelievable, really, to think of the players that have been through Middlesbrough. So I'd go Juni Ravinelli, Schwarzer for me, purely on a a personal point for me, I'd put Nick Farnby because he was influential for me because yeah, he made me, he, he lifted my my game and he was the first person to come who I thought I should be able to do what he does and why can't I? And then when I look at him playing, he had such a positive effect on me that I, I couldn't, you know, maybe not, not for the football club he was influential, but for, for me, he was massive and um, so I'd put him in my three but the midget gems. Him. If it wasn't for him, Schwartz would be there. The midget gems, yeah. is that right? Uh, you, you're not yeah. that midget, are I mean, you? It, it was, honestly, my game changed so much, Dave, when, when he came, because I was similar to him. We were very, very similar players, and we all, he was a very clever player, and he knew where to be on a football pitch. And the, the, the strength of Nick was, he would always do what you thought he was going to do. Players don't always do that. The game's dead simple if people do that. But he always... I knew if he was going to pass it, I knew if there was a pass on, he would pass it. He, it's like the first goal. You know, the first goal, he could have went in and took a shot because he was in on goal. But he didn't. I knew he was going to square it because that's what he was like. He, he got just as much pleasure setting a goal up as he did scoring a goal. Maybe more so at times. So for me, he, he changed my game massively. And that's why I'd put him as, as one of the most, not for Middlesbrough, but for me at the mm. time, along with Juni and Rav. But Schwartz definitely would, would come into that equation. When you've got a keeper like him, it makes everything else so much easier. 
Steve, I'm going to ask you here to mm. slightly awkward one, but you know, and we were talking, we were talking yesterday, weren't we? And mm. we, uh, I think it's right that you both pay tribute to each other here because what you know, you were both played as teammates a lot of years. What 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 made Higgy such a favourite with the fans? You think, and presumably favourite with the with the players too. Um, I think <clears throat> people don't probably realise that the influence that Higgy had. Um, on them, them seasons we've all we've been talking about um, for scoring goals, setting up goals, setting people up in front of goal. Um, if you look on YouTube at, at them seasons between '95 and '98, um, as well as Ravenelli being on there, Mikel Beck, Paul Merson, Iggy features a hell of a lot in them games, and, and people probably don't realise how much of an influence he had on on the success that we had. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not one for blowing smoke. You know, um, for people's Go backside. On then. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just uh, that's one thing I would say to people: take a look on YouTube at the, at the them seasons from '95 onwards, and you'll you'll see how much of an influence that Iggy had on the success that we had. And um, the year that he, he, he wasn't there, um, it was it was a big surprise to me after after he left, and the, the fact the club didn't offer him a contract which was uh, a massive surprise to me. And, um, yeah, I think... Uh, yeah, you he left, you left too season. soon, Iggy. You left too soon. Now, right, yeah. Iggy, before you answer about Steve Vickers, I'm going to just... I, I, left, I looked this up yesterday, and these are the centre-backs that Steve Vickers played alongside for Middlesbrough. Derek White, Nicky Moan, Nigel Pearson, Phil Whelan, Mickey Barron, Gianluca Fester, Craig Little, Gary Pallister, Colin Cooper, Jason Gavin, Dean Gordon, Ugo Ehiog, and even at the end, a couple of games with Gareth Southgate. That is now there's there's a long list of centre backs that suggest somebody who uh, was a, a survivor uh, right through uh, some big eras there. Higgy, over to you. What? And, and the reason he did that was because he looked after himself. He was just a, a really good pro, Steve. He, he was he trained hard every day. He was Mister Dependable. You knew you weren't going to have a bad game. If Stevie was playing, he'd never make a massive rick. He'd, he'd always be there when you needed him. Balls coming across the box, you knew he was going to be stood in the right place. He just knew the position unbelievably well. And I think he, he obviously had a calmness as well. I mean, I, I remember the games against the, the Liverpool one where he scored. and um, We both scored that night, <laughs> You are? We both scored that night, didn't we? We did both score that night, yeah. but... It, it was just, it, if Stevie was playing, you knew that, you know, because you, you were quick, weren't you? you? You could move and you could read the game well. And you always knew that he was safe. You know, I never, when a ball was coming and it was going towards Stevie, there was some centre halves where I'd think, I hope he controls that properly. <laughs> but with Stevie, you never thought that. You just thought, oh, he's, he's got this now, it's, it's come over to him. So, for a centre half to, to be that safe, you know, you, you're in good hands. I think Nigel was similar, you know, Nigel was, was very yeah. safe and he would do things right. So I was never ever, the decision making with Stevie was right. You know, if the ball needed to go into Rosette, it would go in Rosette. If it needed to clear up the field, it would. But if he could play out, then he would play out. You know, he was, he had a bit of everything for a centre half, Stevie. He, he, he wasn't scared to come out with the ball when he had to. Just like, he'd just pass it 10 yards if he needed to. So, like I say, the game's quite simple. And, and as you become a coach and, and manager, you want people to do things simply and properly. And, and Stevie would always do that. So, I think the biggest compliment you can pay anyone is that it's sound, dependable, good pro, never in trouble. Yeah, good, a good simple. team. Good team. <laughs> a good team player. And, and obviously the highest hair at the football club as well at the time. He at one a, point. At one point, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, still, it's, still, uh, still, uh, it's still there, Steve. It's going, it's it's going a lot better than mine. Yeah. It's going a lot about, better than yeah. mine. Listen, he's still guys, got it a bit now. You can see he's still got it a bit now. He has, yeah. He's yeah, yeah, all about to lose it, Dave. Stevie's still growing his. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, yeah. guys, guys, sadly, we've run out of time on Tease Life's Borough Backtrack for this week in association with Domino's Teesside. Branches right across the region, the best place for pizza. So our thanks for your time and sharing your memories to Steve Vickers and to Craig Higgins. Brilliant to uh, go on that trip down memory lane. 
we'd love to do it again in the future with you. Join us next week when we've lined up something a little bit different, a reunion that I tell you what, you are going to enjoy next week on Borough Backtrack. Look forward to it. See you then. <laughs>